Jesus is not here, for he is risen, just as he said, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On May 6th, 1954, a 25-year-old medical student named Roger Bannister became the first man ever to clock running the mile in under four minutes. Here's a picture of him where he's breaking both the tape at the finish line, you can see it's just a little tiny tape, and also the world record. Bannister became an instant sensation. The New York Times actually said that he had accomplished, quote, one of man's hitherto unattainable goals. Folks had tried. Some had even come close, but no one could do it. They just couldn't do it. How can you accomplish something that is widely believed to be impossible? Well, after the race, Bannister was interviewed, and he said that he thought that, quote, the four-minute mile has been overestimated. See, he didn't think that it was an impossibility. He didn't think that way, like everybody else did. And so, he did it. Well, as amazing as that was, Bannister's breakthrough didn't only affect himself. Just 46 days later, a runner named John Landy broke Bannister's record. The human impossibility became possible for one man and then immediately for others as well. Bannister's run was a true game changer. Something shifted in the collective minds of runners. And since then, official times for the mile have come in under four minutes again and again and again. Well, this morning, we celebrate a game-changing event that didn't just change a sport. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead is the greatest game changer of all time. Why? Well, because it's not only significant for a few people, like folks who may happen to be interested in religion or something. Christ's resurrection broke hitherto unbreakable barriers and opened up new possibilities for human life universally. And so this morning, I want to share with you about this new reality brought on by Christ's resurrection. And then I want to share with you two ways that you and I can respond to it. So first, the reality itself. Our gospel passage from Matthew 28 that Deacon Mike just read for us in verse 1 says that the resurrection took place after the Sabbath toward the dawn of the first day of the week. Now stop there for a second. If God was going to do something spiritually significant, his people, the Jewish people, they would have thought that the Sabbath would be a great day to do it. The Sabbath was so significant for them. The seventh day, it was set apart from all other days of the week as a day of rest and worship to remind them that they were not slaves, but were the free people of the one true God. But when it came to the resurrection of Jesus, God skipped the Sabbath. Jesus died on Friday, Saturday came, and nothing. Nothing happened. The resurrection happened after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week. The first day. Well, what's so special about the first day? The first day is not a, a day of rest. It hasn't been set aside. The first day is a work day. And in fact, it had always been a work day ever since creation. Even God himself worked on the first day of the week. Genesis chapter 1 says that in the beginning, God was at work creating the heavens and the earth. He made light. He called it day. He made dark. He called it night. And verse 5 concludes, there was evening and there was morning the first day. The first day of the week. It's the beginning of creation. The seventh day is a day for rest, but God skips over that day. Now we've cycled back to the first day again. And look, God's at work again. He raises Jesus from the dead in a creative act that can only be compared with creation itself, only now it's a sort of recreation ushering in something new. 
In the resurrection, God has begun renewing that original creation. This first day has become an eighth day, signaling something new in history, full of new possibilities. Well, what kind of possibilities? Well, not merely the resuscitation of a corpse, right? Those aren't the possibilities, just a dead person coming alive again. That had, that had already happened. Think of Lazarus, Jairus' daughter, and they both were raised again to a normal life that ended again in death. So not, not just the resuscitation of a corpse, but Romans 6, 9 says, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. In Jesus' resurrection, something happened within this world that pointed to a new world with new possibilities, a new kind of life possible in it. And this new kind of life isn't just for Jesus. Scripture ties Christ's resurrection to ours, yours and mine. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 says, Christ's resurrection is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He's just the first of many who are going to live this new kind of life. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is truly a game changer for humanity. And you know what? As a game changer, the resurrection isn't just about like something like breaking scientific rules, like, oh, look, God can do magic. Isn't that cool? That's not what this is about. It's not about breaking scientific rules any more than when Roger Bannister attained the unattainable, right? In fact, Christians don't think the resurrection is in conflict with science at all, but a move beyond what science had yet experienced. No scientific law was transgressed in the resurrection. Instead, God the creator added something new to his creation equation. Science isn't contradicted, it's moved forward. The first day of the week, the day of creation, has become the eighth day, the day of new creation. The resurrection of Jesus is a universal event with universal ramifications opening up brand new possibilities for all humanity. That is our new reality. And you know what, this new reality, this is good news. Why? Well, because our world is broken, right? I mean, we see it right now all around us in our disease-riddled globe. We are mortal. And if you didn't want to participate in Lent this year, COVID-19 ensured that all of us had to come to terms a little bit more with that Ash Wednesday truth that we are dust, and to dust we shall return. Our world is broken. It's a broken world, and Scripture says that it's broken because of sin. Romans 5.12 Sin came into the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. We've all contributed to the brokenness in our world. We've all behaved in ways that place us in antagonism toward God or others or even ourselves and creation. Things like our pride, our self-centered behavior. These are manifestations of our sin and they lead to death. Even when we're at our best, Right? And we see random acts of human kindness, which are good and like genuinely heartwarming. We're still seeing those acts in the middle of a sin-cursed world where everyone's end is the grave. That's still our situation. But Jesus' resurrection signals a new kind of world, a new creation kind of world with an evolved new creation kind of life. And the good news is that you and I can get in on it. How? How do we get in on it? How do we respond to such a game-changing event as the resurrection? In our passage in Matthew, I see a two-part answer. After Jesus' death, Mary Magdalene 
and another Mary make their way to the tomb where they fully expect to find Jesus's body, right? They, they, they know he's dead, but they are deeply devoted to him. These are faithful disciples of Jesus, faithful even when he's dead. But when they arrive, they don't see Jesus. Instead, they see an angel. And this angel gives them two directions. In verse 6, the angel says, come and see. And in verse 7, the angel says, go and tell. These two postures, come and see and go and tell, these are the two ways that we respond to Christ's resurrection. First, come and see. In verse 10, after the Marys leave the angel, uh, they meet Jesus himself. And when they meet him, he tells them, do not be afraid, uh, but go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Jesus wants to extend the opportunity to come and see him, not just to the devoted Marys, but to his absentee disciples as well, who he, he here calls brothers. Now, this is the point I want to make. It is very simply this, that there are a lot of other names that Jesus could have called his disciples at that moment. I mean, these are the guys of whom the closest three to Jesus fell asleep when he needed them in the Garden of Gethsemane. These are the guys of whom their spokesman denied even knowing Jesus. These are the guys who every single one of them deserted him at the first sign of danger. These guys. And now Jesus says, I want my brothers to see me just like you faithful ladies get to see me. What an amazing picture of pardon. The first thing that happens when you come and see the resurrected Jesus Christ is that you receive the forgiveness of your sins. That's the first thing that happens. All your faults, all the ways you've betrayed folks, all the things you've done to make yourself an enemy of God and others and of yourself and of creation, they're forgiven. They're wiped clean, and you are called a brother. You're called a sister. Even the most unfaithful of folks get to participate in resurrection life. The second thing that happens when you come and see the resurrected Jesus is you get to enjoy the safety of his presence. You get to enjoy him. When Mary and Mary find Jesus, Verse 9 says they came up and they took hold of his feet and they worshiped him. You can almost feel their relief as they collapse at Jesus' feet and they just hold on to him knowing that they're safe and all is well. Yes, the world is broken, but now because of the resurrection, it won't always stay that way. Julian of Norwich famously wrote, it was necessary that there should be sin but all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of thing shall be well. This is the kind of assurance and safety we receive in Christ, and it can't be undone. It can't be undone, not even by very real hardships in this life. I spoke to a friend this week who recently returned from Lebanon. He took a trip there, and while he was there, he spoke to a Syrian refugee, a mother and her child. And throughout the conversation, he just kept his mind, kept going back to this question, and he kept asking her, but are you safe? Are you safe? It was the question he had to just keep asking. He was concerned for her well-being. Are you safe? To which came her confident reply, I am safe in God. I am safe in God. In the middle of terrible circumstances, this woman got to hold on to Jesus. She gets to hold on to Jesus. She's still in that situation, but she knows there's a new reality that has begun in the resurrection and it will be completed when he comes again. Come and see. Receive both forgiveness of your sins and also safety in life with Christ. The second way we get to respond to the reality of Christ's resurrection is to go and tell. Go and tell. 
After the angel told the Marys, come and see, he followed it up in verse 7 saying, then go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Yes, come and see. Receive your own forgiveness and safety in Jesus Christ. But don't stop there. Don't stop there. Others need it too. Go and tell them. Our faith is not only given for our own sake, but also for the sake of others. One church father, Rabanus, wrote, The glad tiding of the resurrection is not given for you alone for the secret comfort of your own hearts, but you must extend it to all who love him. And notice what the angel says, go quickly, go quickly. Spreading the good news is urgent. Why? Well, because like we said earlier, people are suffering. Our world is broken and people need forgiveness and safety in Jesus. They need to hear the news that Christ's resurrection can change their life just like it changed yours. They need to hear that they too can be one of the happy ones who in the midst of pain or pandemic can say with the Syrian refugee, I am safe in God right now. No matter what my circumstances are, I am safe in God. Spreading this word is urgent. It needs to happen. And it's a task that is given to everyone who has experienced the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Every single one of us is commissioned for this work. One commentator summed it up. Salvation is for service. Friends, God has inaugurated a new reality. He's broken through barriers we thought were impossible to break through. And in so doing, he's begun a new creation with new possibilities. And you and I are invited to come and see, to participate in this resurrection reality. If you've never received the benefits of Christ's resurrection, today's your day. Today is your day. I want to encourage you, turn to Jesus and receive forgiveness and begin a new life of safety with him. You can simply pray in your heart something like this. Jesus, I believe that you are the Lord of life. I believe that God raised you from the dead and I want to get in on that resurrection life. I want to receive it. If that's you, if you're praying a prayer like that this morning, I would love to hear about it. Maybe you could just even email me and tell me, rob at redeemeranglican.com. I want to hear your story so I can begin praying for you. And then when this whole shelter in place thing is over, let's make a time to go out and we'll sit down, we'll meet up, and we'll plan a time for you to be baptized. If you've already put your trust in Jesus and you've already, you've already received the benefits of his resurrection, I want to encourage you Remember the gift that you have. Don't let over-familiarity let it shrink in your heart. Don't let that happen. Instead, renew your fervor in sharing the good news with those around you. Ask God to ignite in your heart a zealous love of the gospel and of those who need to receive it. Friends, Christ is risen. And that changes everything. Amen. <laughs>